Evet. Hocam nasıl yapalım? Evet, hocam başlayabilir miyiz? Evet. Zamanımızı uyuyalım. Na, na, nasıl isterseniz başlayabiliriz. Um, evet. Konuşmacımız var mı? Gör, görmüyorum gelecek. ben. Gelecek. doğru gelecek. Konuşmacımız o, o. biraz geç gelecekmiş. Bu kısmı e, özellikle e, şey biraz daha biz bize noktasında Türkçe değerlendirmiş hocam şeyimiz Ali Kamaca planlarken. O yüzden 7 gibi 7'ye 10 kala falan herhalde katılacak kendileri de. Aynen öyle. Ta tamam ben ben de kendi hiç söyleyeceklerimi İngilizce hazırlamıştım o katları diye artık Türk Türkçe söyle. Onu, onu da onun konuşmasının sonunda söylersiniz hocam. <gülüyor> o, oldu peki. Onun da sırası var. Hasan hocam başlayabilir miyiz? Tabii başlayarız. Teşekkür ediyorum. Başlayabiliriz. Sağ olun. Sayın Sanayi ve Teknoloji Bakanım, Sayın Bakan Yardımcım. Sayın TÜBİTAK Başkanım, kıymetli aziz hocam, kıymetli katılımcılar, ülkemizin bilimsever değerli insanları. TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitüsü'nün Reaziz Sancar Lekçe etkinliğine hoş geldiniz. Sizlere en içten dileklerimle, saygıyla, samimiyetle ve sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Bir zamanlar sükut eden TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitüsü, Sayın Cumhurbaşkanımızın hiçbir zaman unutmayacağımız, unutamayacağımız değerli desteğiyle adete külden alev doğarak bilimi ufukları kapsamında araştırma ve eğitim faaliyetlerini giderek artan heyecanla devam ettirmektedir. Bu kapsamda bu akşam en heyecan verici etkinliklerimizden birini Reaziz Sancar Lekçe etkinliğimizi gerçekleştirmek üzere bir araya gelinmiş bulunmaktayız. Etkinliğimiz Amerikalı bilim insanı, virolog ve doktor, 2020 Nobel Fizyoloji ve Tıp Ödülü sahibi Harvey James Alter'in konuşmasıyla gerçekleştirilecektir. İnsanlık tarihinin bütün dönemlerinde birbirinden değerli bilim insanları yoğun zihinsel emekleriyle nitelikli bilgi üreterek uygarlığın gelişim sürecini hızlandırmış insanlığa üstün hizmet etmiştir. Bilim tarihi bu insanları unutmamaktadır. Çünkü bilim en güzel uğraş olduğu gibi aynı zamanda bir vefa aşılayıcısıdır. Günümüzde cığır açan bilimsel çalışmalarıyla uygarlığın gelişimine üstün hizmet etmiş bilim insanlarının onuruna dünyanın gelişmiş ülkelerinde çeşitli etkinlikler düzenlenmektedir. Ve Aziz Sancar Lekçe etkinliğimiz bu geleneğin yeni bir parçasıdır. Nobel ödülüne layık görülen cığır açan buluşlarıyla Türkiye'nin ve dünyanın dört bir yanında Türk insanının göğsünü kabardan ve bizlere bu geleneğin bir parçası olma imkanı sağlayan Aziz hocamıza çok minnettarız. Her yıl bir konuşma şeklinde gerçekleştirilecek olan ve Aziz Sancar Lekçe etkinliğimiz Etkinliğimizde yeni bilimsel keşifleri dünyanın en seçkin bilim insanlarından dinleme fırsatımız olacaktır. Ve Aziz Sancar Lekçe etkinliğimiz bilim insanlarımızda ileri bir bilimsel görüşün oluşmasına zemin yaratacak, bilim sevdalı gençlerimizin araştırma hevesini alevlendirecektir. Ve Aziz Sancar Lekçe etkinliğimiz ülkemizde bilimsel merakın ve bilim kültürünün yaygınlaşmasına önemli katkılar sağlayacaktır. Uluslararası boyutu göz önüne alındığında ve Aziz Sancar Lecture etkinliğimiz coğrafi sınırlara, illere ve ırklara bakmaksızın 
bilimin birleştirici özelliğine hizmet edecektir. Ve son olarak Aziz Sancarlıkça etkinliğimiz, Aziz hocamıza olan uygumuzun bir simgesi olarak bilim tarihimize geçecektir. Ben bu noktada Sayın TÜBİTAK Başkanımız Profesör Doktor Hasan Mandalı konuşmasını konuşmalarını yapmak üzere sahneye davet ediyorum ve sözü kendisine bırakıyorum. Söz Sayın TÜBİTAK Başkanımızındır. Evet. Evet, teşekkür ediyorum Ali Kam Hocam, ee, kıymetli Aziz Hocam. E, aynı zamanda bugün bizle fiziken olamasa da e, çevrim içinde katılmak için özel bir çaba e, gayret gösterdi Sayın Bakanımız ama şu an Hamburg'da bir toplantıda ama en azından biraz sonra kendisinin mesajlarını da dinlemiş olacağız. Bu kapsamda da hem bakanımıza, bakan yardımcımıza ama özellikle de siz değerli katılımcılarımıza ve en önemlisi de öğrencilerimize sevgi ve selamlarımı sunuyorum. İyi akşamlar diliyorum. Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitümüz olarak özellikle pandemi dönemini bir fırsata dönüştürme noktasında başlatmış olduğumuz bu tip çevrim içi ortamlarda Değişik zamanlarda bir araya geldik ama ilk kez bu kapsamda geniş bir katılımla beraberiz. O yüzden bu sorumluluk bizi gerçekten bir tarafta heyecanlandırıyor ama aynı zamanda da e, sorumluluğumuzu bir kat daha arttırıyor. E, bunun en önemli gerekçeleri, tabii bugün iki önemli kişi var. Birisi bu seriyi başlatmış olduğumuz ve kendisiyle her zaman bir araya gelmekten büyük öğrenme sürecinde olduğum, onur duyduğum Aziz Hocamız, Aziz Sancar Hocamız. Sağ olsun tekrar bugün bizi kırmadı. Hem bu etkinliğin yılda bir kez de olsa bizlerle e, çevrim içinde olsa bire geleceğimiz Aziz Sancar e, e, konuşmaları olarak başlatılan bu etkinlik için kendisine ismini kullanma e, hakkını verdiği için teşekkür ediyoruz. Ve yine bugün konuşmayı yapacak olan da 2020 yılındaki Nobel ödülü kazanan bilim insanlarımızdan e, Harvey James Altra da tekrar teşekkürlerimizi sunuyoruz. Ali Kam hocamız bu oturumun bu kısmını birazcık daha işte bizlerle açılış kısmını planlamış. O yüzden Türkçe vermemizi istedi. Biraz sonra tabii ki konuşmaya geçince İngilizce olarak devam edecek oturum. Kendileri de katılınca misafir konuşmacımız. Tabii biz konuya şöyle bakıyoruz. Biraz önce Ali Kam hocamız temel bilimler noktasındaki yaklaşımı TÜBİTAK açısından, enstitü açısından ama bütün dünyaya baktığımız zaman özellikle pandemi dönemiyle birlikte bilime olan ihtiyacın çok daha fazla arttığını ve bu anlamda da birçok ülkenin yani gelişmiş olarak ifade ettiğim ülkenin de bulundukları düzeyler anlamında e, mutlaka gelişimin olduğunu da söyledi. Yani bilime olan ihtiyaç var ama katkı verme noktasında gerçekten çok daha fazla temel bilimin, bilimin ve özellikle de temel bilimler alanının desteklenmesi olan ihtiyacı ön plana çıkardı. Takibinde de özellikle şu an gündemde olan iklim değişikliği ve özellikle 2022 yılının işte UNESCO'nun atıfta bulunduğu e, uluslararası e, kapsamda bilim yılı olarak 2022 yılını sürdürülebilir kalkınma için temel bilimlerin önemli noktasını gündeme getirdi. Dolayısıyla e, gelecekte e, özellikle iklim değişikliği ve bununla ilgili başlıkların tümünün üzerinden gelebilme noktası anca temel bilimler olabilecek. Ve bu anlamda e, bakıldığı zaman da gerçekten geleceğe doğru tüm senaryo yaklaşımlarının içerisinde e, daha fazla karamsar olabiliriz. Ama bilim temelli yaklaşımlarda da o fırsatı görebiliriz. Biz de kendi çapımızda TÜBİTAK olarak bu süreçlere vermiş olduğumuz önem ve katkı noktasında bunu kıymetli bulduğumuz için e, özellikle temel bilimler yaklaşımımızı, temel bilimler enstitümüzü araştırma yapmanın ötesinde araştırma, temel bilimler araştırmacılarının ortak buluşma noktası olarak buluşma noktasında katkı vermeye çalışıyoruz. O anlamda e, biz temel bilimlerin tüm bileşenleriyle birlikte aktif olmaya çalışan bir enstitümüz e, ve biraz önce de bahsettim e, birçok değişik yaş gruplarına yönelik eğitim e, faaliyetlerimiz var. Ee, ama özellikle bu seriyi biz çok kıymetli buluyoruz. Çünkü biraz önce de ifade ettim. Bunu Aziz Sancar hocamızın ismiyle başlattık. Kendisinin 2015 yılındaki e, e, almış olduğu Nobel ödülünü çok iyi biliyoruz. Ve e, hem e, Türk bilim camiasına, Türkiye'deki bilim insanlarına, hem Türk, e, Türk 
Türkiye'deki tüm Türk bilim insanlarının tüm dünyadaki camiasına ve tüm evrensel noktadaki insanlığa sunmuş olduğu bir katkı noktasında gerçekten haklı bir gururu yaşattığını düşünüyoruz ve bundan dolayı da kendisine bir kez daha teşekkür ediyoruz. Ve bu sürecin artarak yine devam edeceğini de biliyoruz. Hocamızın yeni yaptığı çalışmaları da yakından izliyoruz. Basın yoluyla da olsa ve yine kendisiyle de birkaç kez bir araya gelme şansını yakalamış bir bilim insanı olarak da her defasında bir araya geldiğimizde bilim yapmanın önemini, bilimi gençlerle birlikte yapmanın önemini ve özellikle Türk camiasındaki, Türk kültüründeki var olan potansiyellerimizin çok daha fazla ön plana gelmesi konusundaki çabalarını biliyorum hocamın. Her açıdan yani sadece laboratuvarda kalmayarak bunu yaygınlaştırma noktasındaki çabalara da bizzat şahit olmuş bir hocanız veya bir meslektaşınızım. Biz de bunun üzerine kendimiz bu yapmaya çalıştığımız yakın zamanda eminim sizlerin de bilgisi dahilinde hocamızın ismi doktora sonrası araştırma bu programımızı başlattık ve bu programımız şu an e, yürürlükte e, ve başarılı olan arkadaşlarımız da hocamızın yanında belli bir sürede doktora sonrası araştırma yaparak araştırma ekosistemimize katkı vermeye e, devam edecekler. Yine bu yılın özellikle e, biraz önce de ifade ettim, e, işte temel bilimlerde sürdürülebilir kalkınma noktasındaki önemi üzerine yakın zamanda e, UNESCO Dünya Bilimler Akademisi ile yani TUAS olarak bilinen e, ortaklaşa bir müzakeremiz oldu ve bir anlaşma imzaladık ve bu yıldan başlayarak temel bilimler alanında özellikle 25 tane e, bilim, genç bilim insanını doktora düzeyinde ve doktora sonrası araştırma yapmak üzere Türkiye'ye gelmek üzere destekliyor noktasında olacağız. Ee, özellikle gelişmekte olan ülkelerden ve Türkiye Cumhuriyetleri de buna dahil olmak üzere. Yani dolayısıyla Türkiye'de doktora eğitimi ve doktora sonrası araştırmalarını Türkiye'de gerçekleştirmek üzere 25 tane e, genç başarılı bilim insanının Türkiye'de desteklenmesine yönelik e, yol masraflarını e, tuvas karşılayacak. Biz de Türkiye'deki e, araştırma imkanları noktasında burs veriyor olacağız. Bu da yine bu yıl başlatmış olduğumuz. E, yine e, bu anlamda e, e, dün gerçekleştiriyor olduğumuz e, işte 2022 yılı sürdürülebilir bir kalkınma için Uluslararası Temel Bilimler Yılı kapsamında TÜBA ile birlikte, Türkiye Bilimler Akademisi ile birlikte e, bir etkinliğimiz oldu. E, Türkiye Cumhuriyetler'de yaşayan Genç bilim insanlarımız, doktor aşamasında olan genç arkadaşlarımızla temel bilimler üzerine bir haftalık bir yaz e, kursu düzenliyoruz. E, biz de ona katkı vermeye çalıştık. Bu da güzel bir etkinlik olarak e, e, kesinlikle söyleyebileceğimiz. E, özetle e, bakmaya çalıştığımız gerçekten e, bilime olan ihtiyaç, temel bilime olan ihtiyaç çok daha fazla artıyor olacak. Bunun içinde olmazsa olmaz en önemli e, ihtiyaç noktası insan kaynağımız ve her yaş grubundaki insan kaynağımız biz de TÜBİTAK olarak bu süreçlerin içinde olmaya devam edeceğiz. Bugünkü tabii bizlerle birlikte olacak olan konuşmacımız 2020 yılında fizyoloji ve tıp alanındaki Nobel ödülünün sahibi Dr. Harvey James Alter. Kendisi bir tıp araştırmacısı, hekim ve virolog ve çok sayıda bilimsel keşif ve başarılar içeren bir kariyere sahip. Özellikle hepatit B virüsünü ve daha sonra da hem e, A hem de B olmayan e, yani non A, non B, yani, e, non e, B, e, nokta, NAN B noktasındaki virüsün e, veya hepatit C olarak bildiğimiz e, virüsün saptanmasına yol açan Avustralya antijeninin keşfedilmesinde önemli bir rol aldı. E, bu önemli keşiflerin ötesinde kendisi aynı zamanda hepatit C enfeksiyonunun doğal seyrini tanımlayarak sıklıkla kronik hepatite ilerleyen ve ayrıca siroz ve karaciğere bağlı ölümlere evrimini kanıtlamış e, noktasında katkıda bulundu. Bu bulgunun devamında da yine Doktor Alter'in milyonlarca e, transfüzyonla ilişkili hepatit vakasının önlenmesine izin veren diğer bulguları da elde eden bir bilim insanı. Kendisi e, e, Amerika Birleşik Devletleri Halk Sağlığı Servis tarafından verilen en yüksek ödül olan Halk Sağlığı Hizmeti Üstün Hizmet Madalyası'na dahil olmak üzere birçok ödülün sahibi. Ayrıca e, transfüzyon tıbbı alanında uluslararası itibara dayalı Amerikan Kan Bankaları Birliği'nin e, Karl Leinstein anma ödülünün sahibi 
Yine e, Amerika'daki Ulusal Bilimler Akademisi ve Tıp Akademisi'nin üyesi ve Ulusal Sağlık Enstitülerinin seçkin araştırmacılarının arasında kendisi yer alıyor. Dolayısıyla e, kendisini de bu şekilde gerçekten tanımış olmaktan, yapacağı konuşmayı dinleyecek olmaktan, ilham verici konuşması dinleyecek olmaktan dolayı da memnuniyetimizi ifade ediyor. Kendisine de şimdiden tekrar teşekkürlerimizi kurumum adına, TÜBİTAK adına sunuyorum. Ve tekrar bugünkü etkinliğin verimli geçmesini diliyor. E, başta e, Aziz Hocamız, e, davetli konuşmacımız Doktor e, Harbi Alter ve siz değerli katılımcılarımıza tekrar katılımlarınız için teşekkür ediyor etkin ve verimli bir e, seminer olmasını diliyorum. Sayın Tübitak Başkanımıza bu değerli konuşması için çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Sanayi ve Teknoloji Bakan Yardımcımız Sayın Mehmet Fatih Kacır, geçmişte ve yakın zamanda Tübitak Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitüsü'nün etkinliklerine katılmış, konuşmalar yapmıştır. Sayın Bakan Yardımcımız ve Aziz Sancar Lekçe etkinliğimizi de duyduğumda çok heyecanlanmış. Fakat yurt dışı görevi nedeniyle video kayıt olarak hazırladı ve konuşmasını bize ulaştırmıştır. Şimdi söz Sayın Bakan yardımcımızındır. Sayın Bakanım, saygıdeğer hocam Profesör Doktor Aziz Sancar, değerli Profesör Harvey Altır, kıymetli katılımcılar, değerli hocamız Profesör Doktor Aziz Sancar'ın onuruna düzenlenen Aziz Sancar konuşması serisinin ilk programında Sizlere hitap ediyor olmaktan büyük memnuniyet duyuyor. Hepinizi sevgi ve saygıyla selamlıyor. Saygıdeğer hocamız Mardin'den başlayıp Nobel'e uzanan hayatında karşısına çıkan engelleri aldırmadı. Bilim insanı olmanın kendisine kazandırdığı merakı kovalamaktan asla vazgeçmedi. Onun ve ekibinin çalışmaları sayesinde kanser başta olmak üzere birçok hastalığın tedavisine bugün bir adım daha yakınız. Hocamızın kıymetli çalışmaları kadar Bizde heyecan ve mutluluk uyandıran husus ise derin vatan sevgisi. Bu topraklara milletimize olan sarsılmaz bağlılığı. Memleketine faydalı olan tüm dünyaya faydalı olur düsturuyla hareket eden hocamız, Türk gençliğine, Türk bilim insanlarına örnek bir başarı hikayesi sunmakta. Onlara rehber olmakta. Bizim bu memlekete borcumuz var diyerek her an memleketine faydalı olmayı hedef edinen, idealleriyle kendini yetiştiren insanların, nasıl evrensel hale gelebildiğini herkese kanıtlamakta. Bu noktada birçok Türk vatandaşının aklına gelen bir soru var. Aziz Sancar hocamız 50 yıl önce ABD'ye ayak basıp bilimsel çalışmalarını o ülkede gerçekleştirmeseydi Nobel ödülü alabilir miydi? Maalesef ki o günün Türkiye'sinin şartlarını dikkate aldığımızda bu soruya olumlu bir cevap vermek oldukça güç. Ama bugün çok farklı bir Türkiye ile karşı karşıyayız. Türkiye artık Kuvvetli arge altyapısına sahip bir ülke. Pandemi tüm dünyada olduğu gibi bize de sağlık alanında bilimsel çalışmaların, inovasyonun, argenin, üretim yetkinliğinin ne kadar önemli olduğunu bir kez daha hatırlattı. Pandeminin ilk döneminde Amerika Birleşik Devletleri Başkanı Amerikan teknoloji devlerine solunum cihazları üretmeleri için sosyal medyada çağrılarda bulunurken Türk mühendislerin yoğun emekleriyle Yerli sorunum cihazımızı iki hafta gibi kısa bir sürede seri üretime kazandırdık. Somali gibi hiç yoğun bakım sorunum cihazı olmayan ülkelere bu cihazları hibe ederek tüm dünyaya nefes olduk. Yine pandemi döneminde attığımız önemli adımlardan bir diğeri, ülkemizdeki araştırma kabiliyetlerini ve deneyimlerini seferber ederek yürüttüğümüz aşı çalışmaları oldu. Türk bilim insanlarımızın yoğun çalışmaları sonucunda yerli inaktif aşımız TÜRKOVAK acil kullanım onayını aldı vatandaşlarımızın hizmetine sunuldu. Böylelikle Türkiye, dünyada COVID-19 aşısı geliştiren sayılı ülkeler arasında yerini aldı. Türk Havak'ın yanında TÜBİTAK'ın desteğiyle yerli VLP ve mRNA tabanlı aşılarımızın çalışmalarına da devam ediyoruz. Bu çalışmalarla birlikte dünyada sağlık alanında çalışmalarda yaşanan gelişmeleri de yakından takip ediyoruz. Özellikle de genetik alanında baş döndürücü hızda yaşanan gelişmelerin tüm insanlığa umut ışığı olduğunu görüyoruz. 90'lı yıllarda insan genom haritası çalışmaları başladı ve bir insanın gen haritasının oluşturulması yaklaşık 13 yıllık bir süreyi aldı. Ve bu projede yaklaşık 3 milyar dolarlık bir kaynak kullanıldı. Bugün artık insan gen haritasının çıkarılması 1000 dolardan az bir maliyette 
gerçekleştirilebilmekte ve harcanan süreyi saatlerle ifade edebilmekteyiz. Genetik kodlarımızı çok daha ucuza ve çok daha hızlı bir şekilde çözümleyebilmek, kişiselleştirilmiş tıp uygulamalarında ve ileri tedavi yöntemlerinde bir çığır açıyor. Omix teknolojileri, rejeneratif tıp, immunoterapi, sentetik biyoloji gibi çığır açıcı alanlarda bilimsel çalışmaların sayısının her yıl katlanarak arttığına yakından tanık oluyoruz. Biz de önümüzdeki dönemde Türk bilim insanlarımızın sağlık bilimleri ve sağlık teknolojilerinde gerçekleştireceği çalışmalara desteklerimizi artıracağız. Hedefimiz Türkiye'yi sağlıkta, sağlık teknolojilerinde dünyada söz sahibi ülkeler arasına dahil edebilmek. Bunun için gerekli fiziki altyapıyı özellikle son 20 yılda yaptığımız yatırımlarla ülkemize kazandırdık. Yetkin insan kaynağımız da mevcut. Aziz Sancar hocamızın çizdiği yolda ilerleyen gençlerimiz, TÜBİTAK'ın hayata geçirdiği Aziz Sancar doktora sonrası araştırma programı ile birlikte insan kaynağımız her geçen gün daha da güçlenmekte. Temennimiz, gençlerimizin yurt dışında araştırmalarına başlamış olsalar dahi günün sonunda çalışmalarını ülkemizde sürdürebilmeleri. Çünkü artık dünya çapında ses getirecek başarılara imza atmanın, geleceğin Aziz Sancarları olmanın yolu, ülkemiz gençleri için bir ömrü vatanlarından uzakta geçirmek değil. Değerli katılımcılar, insanoğlu olarak koronavirüs gibi bulaşıcı hastalıkların yarattığı tahribatı yakından dönemledik. Fakat bu tahribat yalnızca küresel salgınlarla sınırlı değil. Her yıl dünyada yaklaşık 400 bin kişi bir bulaşıcı hastalık olan hepatit C'nin uzun vadeli etkilerinden dolayı hayatını kaybetmekte. Profesör Harvey Alter'ın çalışmaları ise uzun yıllar boyunca hastalığın karanlıkta kalan sebebini araladı. Yalnızca kronik hepatite ışık tutmakla kalmayıp aynı zamanda milyonlarca hayatı kurtaracak olan kan testleri ve tedavilerinin de temeli atıldı. İnsanlık faydasını yürütülen bu çalışmalar asla unutulmayacak. Bugün bir araya gelmemize vesile olan Aziz Sancar konuşmaları ile kendisinin çalışmalarını yakından dinleme imkanına kavuşacağız. Ben bu vesileyle Aziz Sancar konuşmalarının organizasyonunda başta TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitümüz olmak üzere emeği geçen herkese teşekkürlerimi sunuyorum. Sözlerime son verirken bugün bizleri yalnız bırakmayan Aziz Sancar hocamıza ve bizleri aydınlatacak konuşması için Profesör Harvey Altra sonsuz teşekkürlerimi sunuyorum. Sağ olunuz, sağlıcakla kalınız. Şimdi e, Sayın Bakan Yardımcımıza çok teşekkür ediyoruz bu değerli konuşması için. Sanayi ve Teknoloji Bakanımız Sayın Mustafa Baran da yurt dışı görevinden dolayı Ziyazist Sancar Lekşe etkinliğimize video kayıt yöntemiyle hitap edecektir. Ayrıca Sayın Bakanımız ABD'de Birleşmiş Milletler Toplantısına katılırken oldukça yoğun programına rağmen bu bilgiyi bize vermiş ve sonrasında da video kayıt konuşmasını bize ulaştırmıştır. Şimdi söz Sayın Mustafa Baran Bakanımızındır. Saygıdeğer bilim insanları, kıymetli katılımcılar, sevgili gençler, The Aziz Sancar Lecture etkinliğinde sizlerle bir arada bulunmaktan büyük bir mutluluk duyuyor. Öncelikle her birinizi sevgiyle, saygıyla, muhabbetle selamlıyorum. Bu etkinliğin taşıdığı anlam ve içerik itibarıyla çok vizyoner bir girişim olduğuna yürekten inandığımı belirtmek istiyorum. Bu vesileyle The Aziz Sancar Lecture girişiminin hayata geçmesinde katkısı olan TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitüsü'ne teşekkürlerimi sunuyorum. The Aziz Sancar Lecture girişimi ülkemizle birlikte bilim dünyasına hayırlı uğurlu olsun. Değerli misafirler, son 20 yıldır Sayın Cumhurbaşkanımızın liderliğinde bilim ve teknoloji alanındaki çabalarımızı kararlılıkla sürdürüyoruz. Milli teknoloji hamlesi ışığında genç yaşlı demeden 7'den 77'ye herkesi bilimin heyecan verici dünyasıyla tanıştırmak için gerçekten büyük çaba gösteriyoruz. Bilimin toplumsallaşması için gece gündüz demeden çalışıyoruz. Bilhassa çocuklarımız ve gençlerimiz de bilim ve teknoloji sevgisini artırmak için yoğun çaba sarf ediyoruz. Heyecanı ve coşkusu her yıl katlanarak artan teknofest yarışmaları, bilim şenlikleri, gökyüzü gözlem etkinlikleri bu çabamızın en önemli nişaneleri. Ulusal ve uluslararası lider araştırmacılar programları bilime, teknolojiye, araştırmacılarımıza verdiğimiz desteğin en somut göstergesi. 
bilim merkezleri, deney yap teknoloji atölyeleri gençlerimizi bilime ve geleceğin trendlerine ısındırma noktasında attığımız önemli adımlardan sadece birkaçı. Bakanlığımızın destekleriyle hayata geçen teknoloji geliştirme bölgeleri, ARGE ve tasarım merkezleri, bilim ve teknoloji ekosisteminin önemli aktörleri olarak görev yapıyorlar. Biz bu politikaları neden hayata geçiriyoruz? Bu programları neden destekliyoruz? Bu hamleleri neden yapıyoruz? Bunun cevabı bizim açımızdan çok net. Çünkü bizim bir derdimiz var. Çünkü biz biliyoruz ki insanlığın gelişiminin itici gücü bilim ve teknoloji tutkusudur. Çünkü biz inanıyoruz ki insanlığın bugününü dününe göre daha güzel yapan bilim ve teknolojidir. İnsanlığın bugün karşılaştığı ve yarın karşılaşacağı sorunlara çare bilim ve teknolojidir. Değerli misafirler, sizlerin de gayet iyi bildiği gibi insanoğlunun dünyayı, uzayı hatta ve hatta kendisini anlama çabaları yüzyıllardır devam ediyor. Bugün gelinen noktada birçok konuda önemli aşamalar kaydettik. Örneğin 1960'lı yılların sonlarına doğru Amerika Birleşik Devletleri uzay programında önemli başarılar elde etti ve insanoğlu ilk kez aya ayak bastı. Bu başarı aya gidecek temel bilgi ve teknolojilerin geliştirilebilmesi sayesinde geldi. Diğer taraftan Amerika Birleşik Devletleri aynı yıllarda çağın hastalığı kanserle mücadele programını da başlattı. Fakat bu program başarıya ulaşamadı. Bunun nedeni de yaşamın moleküler temelleriyle ilgili yeterince bilgiye sahip olamamamızdı. Gördüğünüz gibi temel bilginin ve teknolojinin varlığı ya da yokluğu gece ile gündüz arasındaki fark gibi büyük farklar oluşturuyor. Ama günümüzde yaşamın moleküler düzeyde işleyişine ışık tutan bilgi üretimi konusunda adeta devrimsel gelişmeler yaşandı. Tabi bu gelişmeler öyle kendi kendine olmadı. İnsanlığa hizmet etme yoluna kendini adamış kararlılık sahibi bilim insanları sayesinde gerçekleşti. İşte Aziz Sancar hocamız bu alanda çığır açan bilim insanlarından bir tanesi. Hocamız çalışmaları sayesinde layık görüldüğü Nobel ödülüyle ülkemizi son derece gururlandırdı. Elbette insanlık yararına böylesine önemli çalışmalar gerçekleştiren Aziz Sancar hocamız her şeyi hak ediyor. Bu manada biz de Sanayi ve Teknoloji Bakanlığı olarak bir adım atmak istedik. Bizleri gururlandıran kıymetli Aziz Sancar hocamız adına bir araştırma burs programı ihtas ettik. Esasında biz hocamız için bir şeyi yapalım dedik ama hocamız burada da Kadir Şinaslığını gösterdi. Aziz Sancar doktora sonrası araştırma burs programıyla genç bilim insanlarımız çalışmalarını hocamızın araştırma laboratuvarında sürdürebilecek. Ülkemizde ihtiyaç duyulan nitelikli insan kaynağının gelişimi noktasında bu program ülkemiz için büyük önem arz ediyor. Ve bu sayede yetişen bilim insanlarımız da tıpkı Aziz Sancar hocamızın yolundan ilerleyerek dünyada çığır açıcı işlere imza atacaklar. Değerli misafirler bugün bir araya gelmemizi sağlayan The Aziz Sancar Lecture etkinliğini Aziz Sancar hocamızın onuruna düzenliyoruz. Bu etkinlik bizim için çok önemli bir sayfa. Şüphesiz The Aziz Sancar Lecture'da The Schrödinger Lecture, The Dirac Lecture, The Oppenheimer Lecture, The Abdusselam Lecture gibi dünyadan ses getirecek. Bu manada The Aziz Sancar Lecture ülkemiz için bir ilk olduğu gibi kabul ederse Aziz hocamıza da bir vefa borcumuzdur. Her sene yapılacak bu etkinlikte yeni keşifler veya ortaya çıkan yeni problemler tartışılacak. Daha da önemlisi The Aziz Sancar Lecture bilim camiasına vizyoner bir bakış açısı sağlayacak. Bu sene çevrim içi olarak gerçekleştirdiğimiz etkinliği önümüzdeki yıl inşallah yüz yüze gerçekleştireceğiz. Bu vesileyle sözlerime sonlandırırken Aziz Sancar hocamıza çabaları sebebiyle TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitüsü'ne ve bu etkinliğe ilginiz için siz kıymetli katılımcılarımıza yürekten teşekkür ediyorum. Ayrıca The Aziz Sancar Lecture etkinliğinin ilk konuşmacısı olan Amerikalı bilim insanı, virolog ve doktor, 2020 Nobel Tıp Ödülü sahibi Profesör Henry James Altra da çok teşekkür ediyor. Sizleri tekrar saygıyla selamlıyorum.
Sağ olun. Sayın Bakanımıza çok teşekkür ediyoruz bu değerli konuşması için. Now we can pass the English part of uh, our uh, event and uh, this sorry very much Harvey for delay five minutes. We had a problem in Zoom program, so uh, please excuse us for this. So. Uh, I will give a, a, a very sh short introduction and then Professor Harvey Alte will begin his uh, talk. Dear Dr. Harvey Alte, dear Professor Aziz Sanjar, dear Professor Hasan Mandal, the president of TÜBİTAK, dear participants, dear colleagues and friends, dear students. Today is a special day as we come together for the most exciting scientific event of TÜBİTAK Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences, namely the Aziz Sanjar Lecture Event. We organize this event in, in honor of Professor Aziz Sanjar, the 2015 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry. The Aziz Sanjar Lecture will be delivered annually by eminent scientists. This will be an opportunity to share the excitement of new discoveries and challenges, as well as to provide a visionary perspective in the scientific community. With this in, in mind, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you for this very special event. Those of you joining us through the Zoom platform and those of you watching us through all social media platform of Tubita, the Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey. It is now my distinct pleasure to let you know that tonight we have a, a great speaker, an American scientist, virologist and doctor, the 2020 Nobel laureate in physiology and medicine, is a world-renowned, remarkable mind, as well as very kind, humble, and inspirational scientist from the National Institutes of Health. He has kindly accepted our invitation to deliver the inaugural Aziz Sanjar lecture under the title Hepatitis C, the end of the beginning and possibly the end, the beginning of the end. I would like to point out uh, here that at the beginning of this event, the Minister of Industry and Technology, Mustafa Varank, and the Deputy Minister, Mehmet Fatik Kacir, and the President of Tubitak, Professor Hassan Mandal, in their opening speeches in Turk, given in Turkish, have also expressed the deeper thanks to Professor Harvey Alta for this lecture. So Dr. Alta does not need any introduction at all. Nevertheless, I would like to make a very brief introduction. Harvey Alta has been designated a distinguished NIH investigator and only one of 23 NIH scientists to hold that distinction. In his long career in clinical research, Dr. Alta has played a key role in the discovery of two hepatitis viruses, namely hepatitis B virus, HBV, and the non-A and non-B virus, later designated the hepatitis C virus, HCV. In long-term prospective studies, Alta has defined the natural history of NA and B in HCV infection and prove it is frequent progression to chronic hepatitis and it is evolution in cirrhosis and liver related mortality. Dr. Alta has been awarded numerous honors. Among them are PHC, the Public Health Service, Distinguished Service Medal, the AABB Landsteiner Prize, the first international medal for science from Francis I. N. Serum, the American College of Physicians, ACP, Award for Outstanding Work in Science, and the Distinguished Achievement Award of AASLB. He was elected to both the National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Medicine, and achieved master status in the ACP. And finally, 2020, Dr. Alta was awarded 
the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. With this, I want to invite Dr. Alta to the stage to begin his lecture. Harvey, thank you so much and please come. Thank you. I had it before. You can you share your your I'm slides? Yeah, one second. Here I go. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Akram. That's a very nice introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to to be here to honor Dr. Sancer. Uh, for his distinguished career uh, and to be with friends from Turkey. I've been to Turkey twice and I, I, love, I love my time there. So I, uh, my, the title of my talk today is pretty much what we're going to discuss. Uh, we are, I think, at the end of the beginning of this uh, HCV uh, uh, epidemic, if you will, and we have hopes that this could be the beginning of the end. Uh, but in the U.S., we always have to start our talks with uh, financial disclosures. Uh, I don't know if you do that in Turkey, but people who work at NIH only dream about having financial disclosures. Uh, but I do, I do have some other disclosures. Uh, first, uh, my, my guiding scientific principle is that to steal from one is plagiarism, but to steal from many is research. <laughs> and I think we can all agree on that. Uh, also, nothing I say reflects the position of the U.S. government, which instantly gives it great credibility and relevance. Lastly, I want you to know I'm not really bald. Uh, I am a hair donor. And finally, my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. And also, my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. So with that, let's proceed. At the uh, time I won the Nobel Award, I received this congratulatory card from Paul Pokras and his wife. And I thought it was profound. It said, there is no elevator to success. You have to take the stairs. And I think if there's any message I want to leave to the young people in the audience today, uh, this is it. Uh, science is a very stepwise process. And the stairs not only go up, but they also go down. Uh, and you reach disappointments. Uh, but you keep at it. Uh, the stairs may lead you to success. So I want to go through those steps. Uh, the relevant studies uh, began in uh, the late 1960s uh, with the initiation of this prospective study of open heart surgery patients at the NIH. This study was started by Dr. Robert Purcell, Dr. Paul Schmidt, and Dr. Paul Holland, but I took it over in 1970. Uh, in this study, we used only, uh, followed only uh, open heart surgery patients because they received a lot of blood and they did not have underlying immune deficiencies. We sampled them every one to two weeks post transfusion for three months and then every month for an additional three months. Uh, we saved the donor samples uh, whenever we could. But all we could do to measure hepatitis at that time in 1970 was the alanine aminotransferase test, ALT, uh, and serology, early serology for uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis B surface antigen. Uh, but we saved all these samples in a frozen repository. And as technology improved over the years, we were able to go back time and time again and find important new things. The very first thing we found 
was that prior to 1970, the rates of either icteric or anecteric hepatitis were as high as 33%. And uh, this was due, uh, by, uh, shown to be due in part from a study by John Walsh, who showed that if you received at least one unit of blood from a paid donor, a commercial blood donor, uh, you had a 51% chance of getting hepatitis, whereas if you received blood from only volunteer donors, the risk was only 7%. And this is because these paid donors had uh, bad lifestyles and probably were sharing needles and other things. So in 1970, based on this information, we were able to adopt an all volunteer donor system and introduce the first generation test for hepatitis B surface antigen. And as you can see, that caused a precipitous fall in post-transfusion hepatitis from 33% to just under 10%. Even though the amount of blood uh, transfused shown here in these squares uh, did not significantly change. Uh, so this was the first big step and probably nothing we've ever done since that time has had as much impact because we've never had rates as high as this uh, since that time. In 1973, the Abbott Laboratories developed a more sensitive test for hepatitis B surface antigen. We went back into our stored samples and showed somewhat to our surprise that only about 25% or 30% of the total hepatitis was due to hepatitis B virus and that there was some other non-B entity uh, out there. In 1975, Feinstone, shown here on your right, Kapikian and Purcell, discovered the hepatitis A virus uh, using immune electron microscopy. Uh, these were our collaborators here at NIH, so we immediately sent these non-B samples to Steve Feinstone, and he tested them and found that not a single case of non-B hepatitis was due to the hepatitis A virus, the only other known virus at that time. It was thus in a brilliant step of deductive reasoning that we said that these cases were not A and not due to the hepatitis B virus, that we would call them non-A, non-B. And I apologize for this awkward nomenclature, but we chose not to call it hepatitis C at that time because we hadn't yet proven it was a virus, and if so, how many viruses might be involved. The next step was the chimpanzee model. The chimps were instrumental in the early discovery phase of this disease. Uh, some say they should have won the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, and I, I tend to agree to that. Uh, we can't use chimps anymore, but they were so invaluable and they, they did not get sick from these transmission studies and they love being in our studies. You can see them lining up here to sign their informed consents. Uh, but we learned, we learned a lot. And first that we could transmit uh, hepatitis to the chimp uh, from patients who had acute or chronic non-A, non-B hepatitis, and importantly also from totally asymptomatic blood donors who had been implicated in hepatitis transmission. Uh, the chimp led to the next step, and that was this one patient, and we'll call Mr. H. Mr. H was the most valuable patient we ever had in terms of the knowledge gained from him not only by us, but throughout the world because his samples were, were distributed widely. Mr. H was a, uh, as a hobby, liked to climb mountains and blaze trails. And one day while up on a mountain, uh, he had a cardiac arrest and he would have died on the mountain had his wife not been with him and knew how to administer CPR. Uh, she brought him back to life and eventually he made his way to NIH. Shown here in this slide, uh, a lot of data, but they're not so complicated. Just right now, follow the blue curve. 
That is the ALT elevation. So you can see that he was transfused here with 19 units of blood at time zero. The enzymes began to rise around week five and then went up very rapidly to a peak of 2,112. The upper number normal being 40. At that time, he was jaundiced and feeling quite ill. But he recovered rapidly. The enzymes came down uh, quite rapidly uh, and were back almost to normal by week 14. We were fortunate to obtain a unit of plasma at point A uh, at the very peak of his ALT elevation. Uh, I'm sorry, at the on the ascending limb of the ALT elevation. And that was put into a chimpanzee and shown to be infectious with a titer of one times 10 to the 6.5 chimp infectious doses. Uh, this titering done in other chimpanzee by Dr. Purcell. At point B, we obtained another phoresis unit uh, and put that into a second chimp here on the right. And that did not cause hepatitis. And we think it didn't do so because the enzymes were coming way down. And if you go now to the yellow line, this is the HCBRNA levels. You see that the week after transfusion, his HCBRNA level went up a little bit. That was the donor blood it, uh, transmitted to the patient. It then seemed, seemed to be controlled, but at week four, uh, a new variant began to rise and went up to a peak of three times 10 to the seventh copies per ml, almost identical to the chimp infectious doses. Uh, the other reason that it, the sample at point B wasn't infectious was at that time antibody was present and the virus was probably immunocomplex as shown here on the bottom right, but we don't need to go into that. Now we had both the chimp model and this titered infectious inoculum. That allowed us to perturb the inoculum and see what effects it had. Steve Feinstone did this study of chloroform extraction. Uh, uh, uh, well, I, I'm not actually showing that study, but he did chloroform extraction showing that chloroform uh, removed infectivity, uh, showing that the virus had a central lipid in its envelope. And it, the filtration study showed that it was small, it was somewhere between 30 and 60 nanometers. This narrowed the list of potential viral candidates down to this, the small RNA viruses, the alpha viruses or flaviviruses, or it could have been a hepatitis B-like virus, but we had a lot of evidence that it wasn't related to hepatitis B. So I thought it was either gonna be a totally new class of viral agents or one of these small RNA viruses. And Dan Bradley, the CDC, was one of the first to say this is most consistent uh, with being a flaby virus, which, which proved to be correct. Now, uh, we tried to find a specific test for non-A, non-B, but had difficulty in doing so. So meanwhile, we studied the patients more intensively, did liver biopsies on 39 patients, and found that most of them had very mild or only moderate chronic hepatitis. Uh, some had even milder hepatitis, but 10% even had, uh, had cirrhosis and 13% had severe, what was called chronic active hepatitis at that time that would probably progress to cirrhosis. So over time, uh, we did repeat biopsies on 20 of these patients and show that most were stable, uh, that some actually seemed to improve, which may have been just sampling error, but 25% uh, progressed to cirrhosis while under observation. So in the end, we had eight out of 39 patients or 20% who developed cirrhosis. And this number has held up over the de decades, uh, somewhere between 20 and 30% of patients with hepatitis C will uh, go on to cirrhosis. 
And importantly, in this study, we showed that three of these eight patients died of liver failure. Three others had very severe liver disease when they died of their underlying heart disease. Uh, so we now knew that we had a, a serious disease, not just a transaminitis, as some people thought, but a virus that could become persistent and could lead to cirrhosis and liver cell death. So while the clinical severity of non-A-9-B became increasingly evident, uh, we had still had no serologic or enzymatic, radioimmunologic, or even molecular assay that was specific for non-A and non-B. Uh, we tried all of these approaches. Uh, so it was very frustrating. And at that time, I wrote this poem of frustration called, I Can't See the Forest for the HBAGs. It went, I think that I shall never see this virus called non-A, non-B, a virus I cannot deliver, and yet I know it's in a liver, in the liver. A virus which we often blame, but which exists alone by name. No antigen or DNA, no little test to mark its way. A virus in which in our confusion has forced it into mass collusion to make exist just by exclusion. But is it real or an illusion? Oh, great liver in the sky, tell us where and show us why. Send us thoughts uh, for this elusive virus. Uh, let us find this elusive virus. If we don't publish soon, they're going to fire us. Well, this poem, <laughs> Uh, which I had the nerve to present in a scientific meeting, uh, seemed to have stimulated the field. And very shortly thereafter, Michael Houghton and his group at Chiron Corporation cloned the non-A, non-B agent. They did this by taking uh, a known infectious plasma from a human and from a chimp, pelleted the plasma to condense the virus if it was present, excuse me, present, they then extracted the RNA, then reverse transcribed the RNA to cDNA. And then importantly, uh, after cutting this up with restriction enzymes, they used a new phage vector called phage GT11. And this vector would not only carry the genetic information from any virus, <clears throat> but would express any protein that was coded for by, the, by the, the genes. They then infected E. coli with this phage, uh, let the E. coli grow in agar, then lysed the E. coli onto filter paper, and then did another important step. Uh, they made the assumption, Michael Houghton did, that there must be antibody present in people who are infected because uh, no virus uh, has ever been found that doesn't induce an antibody, even though we'd never been able to detect an antibody in the absence of an antigen. Uh, the story goes that Chiron Corporation examined 6 million clones before they found a single clone uh, that was reactive uh, by this assay. But once they had a reactive clone, they could subclone it express the protein, expand the genome, uh, and finally they had enough protein to develop an antibody assay against this virus, which they now called hepatitis C. This is a picture of Dan Bradley on your left at the CDC, who was working with the Chiron Corporation, and Michael Houghton on the right at the time he received the Alaska Award and later the Nobel Prize. As soon as Chiron thought they had discovered the virus, they came to me uh, for a panel I had developed, uh, the infamous non-A, non-B panel, which was a small panel of serum, but highly uh, uh, pedigreed in that every positive sample had been proven infectious in the chimp and every negative sample came from blood donors who had donated at least 10 times and never been implicated in hepatitis transmission. 
every sample in the panel was in uh, in duplicate and every duplicate was in a totally random position. So 19 other laboratories had already tested this panel uh, claiming that they had a non-A, non-B test, but every one of those failed. But the Chiron Corporation broke the code perfectly. They detected antibody to HCV in uh, three patients with chronic non-A, non-B in six different positions. They detected it in two implicated blood donors in four different random samples. They did not detect it in patients with acute non-A, non-B hepatitis because they were looking for antibody, not the virus. These two patients later seroconverted for antibody. And importantly, they did not find the virus in seven cases uh, uh, of negative controls in 14 different positions. So they broke the code perfectly. Knowing that, we then looked at 15 of our non-A, non-B cases and found that in every one, uh, they had been negative for this virus, antibody for this virus, pre-transfusion, and became positive in five to eight weeks post-transfusion. We then looked at the blood donors to 25 of these cases and found a positive donor in 80% by a first-generation assay and 88% by a second-generation assay. So we could then predict that if we introduce this test to blood donor screening, that we might prevent near 90% of post-transfusion hepatitis. That's exactly what happened. I showed you this early part of the slide uh, at the beginning. Uh, over the years, the rates of hepatitis came down uh, because we went to the volunteer donors and we introduced uh, uh, better hepatitis B testing. Uh, and we decreased the amount of blood. So starting around 1979, the amount of blood was reduced to uh, by 50% in general. So the rates kept coming down, but we, and we tried other interventions. We tried to screen the donors with ALT testing. That didn't seem to make a difference. When HIV testing came along in 85, we introduced that, and that didn't seem to make a difference. In 1987, based on our own studies and another study from the TTB group, uh, suggesting that if we used hepatitis B core antigen as a surrogate marker or non-A, non-B, it might reduce the rates by 30%. And indeed it did. So by 1990, our rates were down to 4.1%. At that point, we introduced the first generation test for hepatitis C and the rates came down to 1.1% in 1992, uh, the second generation assay. And by 97, we had reached zero incidence of post-transfusion hepatitis. That doesn't mean it's absolute zero because these are relatively small studies, but we can estimate uh, that in the US, uh, Blood transfusion may have transmitted near 5 million HCV infections in the two decades from 1970 to 1990. And conversely, by introducing these tests in 1990, that we may have prevented an additional 2.4 million transmissions uh, over the next two decades. It's now estimated that the risk of getting post-transfusion hepatitis from hepatitis C is about one in two million uh, compared to one in three in 1970. So this has been a, a dramatic shift in transfusion hepatitis. Uh, I just want to take a little break here uh, to tell you again that I'm a government employee and government employees tend to get a bad rap here in the US. They are thought to be lazy, and living on the government dole. Uh, but I have to tell you that I have always given 100% at work. It's just that it's had this peculiar distribution. Uh, so today is Tuesday, it's not, not my best day of the week. In any event, uh, despite that, uh, we continued our studies. So to this point, we've really at the end of the beginning. Uh, 
Uh, we've seen the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. We've seen the eradication of post-transfusion hepatitis. And soon we're going to see the evolution of great testing. When we looked at our patients uh, in detail, these again, these open heart surgery patients, we found that over time, most patients have this very stable or slowly progressive course uh, where they did not seem to have progressive chronic liver disease uh, over many decades. Uh, on the other hand, 20 to 30% had this severe progression where they developed cirrhosis in 15 to 40 years. Uh, and a small number uh, had progression to cirrhosis as little as five to 10 years. I think these were patients who had coexistent alcoholism or perhaps NASH in, re in retrospect. Um, but this made us interested in why some people have this very mild course but they may live their entire life without developing severe disease, and others had this progressive cross to cirrhosis. With Patricia Farsi, uh, one of my main investigators now at NIH, we looked at those who had slow progression, shown in yellow, and those who had rapid progression to cirrhosis, shown in blue. And what you see is that the slow progressors after the initial rise of HCV RNA post transfusion contained that virus and the RNA levels came down almost to no negative, uh, but not quite. And then there was a secondary rise in HCV RNA, probably another variant that had emerged uh, and uh, then persisted. In contrast, the patients with rapid progression never had this early immune containment, always had high levels of virus throughout their course. We also found that patients who had the rapid progression had high levels of MCP1, mono, monocyte chemotactic protein. This is a pro-fibrogenic protein or chemokine that both attract stellate cells and then is produced by stellate cells. So you keep getting increasing amounts of this MCP, which then the stellate cells then lay down collagen and cause fibrosis. In contrast, the slow progressors had increased levels of interferon gamma and MIP1 beta. These are uh, the good cytokines that decrease inflammation. Over all this time, um, I was married and uh, my wife once said to me, she said, you are the answer to my prayers. But then she went on to say, you are not what I prayed for, but apparently you are the answer. <laughs> so so I, I live with that. <laughs> I want to spend some time now on hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, this was a, a simple study we did with uh, investigators in Japan, particularly Dr. Mizokami and Dr. Yasuhiro Tanaka. They were experts in molecular clocking. This is a mathematical uh, modeling where you can take a virus uh, at two points in time look at the mutation rates in that virus and then extrapolate backwards to when that virus, when that particular genotype uh, emerged from some common ancestor, not when the virus was first present, but when it emerged from some common ancestor. And then you can measure uh, how it spread in time in the population. We can see that in Japan, their genotype 1B diverged from a common ancestor in 1880. And then it was very stable until the 1930s and 1940s when it began to rise rapidly. But what was happening in Japan in the 1930s and 1940s was they were at war, first with China and then with the allies. Uh, and we now know in retrospect that the Japanese soldiers were shooting up with amphetamines before battle 
and sharing needles. Uh, so this was the cause of their epidemic, which is now tapering off uh, because the drug use is not very prevalent in, in Japan and because the initial population has died off. In the US, in contrast, genotype 1A first appeared in 1910 and then was stable until the 1960s, 1970s, and 80s. But what was happening then in the US is that we had our own drug epidemic, our needle sharing, uh, recreational use epidemic, uh, which unfortunately is not abating in the US. But the point of this slide is that there's a 30 to 40 year difference in these two curves. Uh, and that Japan has an eight to tenfold higher incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma than we do in the US. And the Japanese have always said that's because we have had the virus longer than you have. And when you've had it as long as we have, your rates will go up similarly. And that has proven to be true. In this study by Dr. El Sarag uh, at Baylor University, he shows comparing the late 1970s with the late 1990s, a threefold rise in hepatocellular carcinoma in the US. And it's all due to hepatitis C, not to B and not to other causes. Uh, and it was said uh, in 2009 that assuming no changes in the standard of care, the total number of patients with advanced liver disease by 2029 it's projected to be fourfold higher than it was in 2009. And indeed, that's what would have happened. However, there has been a dramatic change in the standard of care. The drugs have progressed from interferon alone to uh, ribavirin, pegylated interferon, and finally to these direct acting antivirals, which are really miracle drugs. So that now, uh, we have 95 to 98 percent cure rates, actually many times 100 percent cure rates in many studies. Uh, these drugs, which are taken orally uh, only for three months, uh, are just amazing in curing virtually everybody. So that is the official end of the beginning, because now we not only have eradicated, discovered the virus, eradicated transfusion hepatitis, but now have these drugs that can cure the disease. Uh, so we have to talk about now, could this be the beginning of the end? Well, that depends on whether you see the glass as half full or half empty. With cure rates now approaching 100%, from this time forward, once HCV infection is identified, no one should develop cirrhosis or die from hepatitis C sequelae. And that's, that's, that's true. But if you see it from the half empty side, you know that there are still many hurdles to eradication. First of all, it's estimated only 20 to 40% of HCV carriers have actually been identified throughout the world. Most people who have this virus don't know they have the virus. Secondly, Access to treatment has been very difficult. Even among known carriers, initially only a minority got treated with these great drugs, though this proportion is increasing as insurance companies have realized that it's cheaper to pay for treatment uh, than to pay for liver transplants and chronic care of cirrhotics. But the high cost of drugs has been an impediment from the beginning. Uh, again, the rates are, the cost is coming down, but it's still very, very expensive to consider using in the developing world. But right now, cure is no longer constrained by science. We have the drugs, we have the tests, but it's really a matter of dollars and, and will. Um, so we could consider this schema to eradicate or eliminate hepatitis C virus. First of all, we have to do massive global screening. We have to do population screening to find these silent 
carriers who don't know they have the infection. You have to do this with rapid assays of high sensitivity. These assays are already available. Uh, they'll get better. Um, but we can now test for this uh, on, the, on site, uh, get an answer within 15 minutes. And now we've even developed uh, rapid PCR tests, so that they're very expensive. But we have the tests uh, to, to actually proceed. And then you need to immediately deliver these, these direct acting antivirals. You deliver them before that patient leaves the site, before they go back into the community uh, so that you don't lose the patient who's just been identified. Again, because this is oral therapy, you can give them a month or two months or three months supply right on the spot. Uh, the drugs have so little side effects that you don't have to follow the recipients very closely. And you don't need a physician to administer these drugs. So where we are now, what we really need now is the political, the corporate, and the moral will to make this happen. And it can happen. And, and proof of the pudding is this. Uh, one country is worth a thousand speeches. Egypt has already shown that you can do this triangulation that I showed you. Uh, the government instituted a program. Uh, they recognized the problem. Egypt had very high rates of hepatitis C. They recognized the problem. They developed uh, cheap tests. They developed cheap drugs and went into this program where in 2006, in phase one, they were treating people just with interferon, curing some, but it was a very difficult treatment. In 2014, they went to these new direct acting antivirals uh, and they prioritized people who had known advanced liver disease. In 2015, they expanded the treatment to everybody using these DAAs and they started a screening campaign of high risk populations. 2018, they decided to screen and treat everybody. This was a presidential initiative by uh, President El Sisi uh, and the Minister of Health. It, it was a remarkable commitment to HCV elimination. In 2019, they're now treating everybody and even going back and treating anybody who relapsed uh, and, and they're resuming the screening campaign to catch more people who were not tested initially. So in Egypt, uh, uh, they portray this as a tip of an iceberg. Egypt has about 60 million population, a little bit over that now. Uh, they treated 2 million and 32,000 uh, patients uh, between 2014 and 2018. They still have another 2 million people they project who haven't yet been tested and they're, they're moving on to those. But of those that they treated, uh, almost all of them, 98.6% have obtained a sustained virologic response tantamount to cure. And the cost of this, because they developed their own medications with the uh, approval of the drug companies, the cost of this was, depending on which drugs they use, was only 50 to 120 US dollars for an entire three month course to cure. Uh, that's the kind of cost that a country could absorb. Uh, at least many countries could absorb. So there's the proof of the principle. They've already shown that this program has uh, reduced the rates of acute uh, hepatitis C shown in blue, the rates of liver cirrhosis and liver failure uh, shown in yellow, and the rates of hepatocellular carcinoma uh, shown in what I believe is green, uh, the triangles. Uh, so things are coming down uh, and they will continue to come down. 
So I I ask you in Turkey and and anybody else listening here to get to adopt such a program for your country. I think you're already on the move in this direction. Uh, I will not be the one to <laughs> be here for the elimination of hepatitis C because I have a new philosophy of life versus age where I have age on the abscissa and on the ordinate I put a give a damn and <laughs> I'm out here heading <laughs> towards retirement, but actually still very, I do give a damn. I'm still very interested in hepatitis C elimination. I'm encouraged that the UN is now involved, the World Health Organization. Many African countries are going to try to follow the model of Egypt. Egypt is willing to supply drugs and tests to some of these countries. And I really think it, it can be done. So to the young people in the audience, take this on as a challenge. Uh, and I'll come back from my grave in 20 years or so and see that there's no more hepatitis C uh, in the world. Thank you very, very much. Harry, thank you very much for this very deep, exciting and comprehensive lecture. That was a pleasure and honor for us. Thank can, you. Can it's now... Can we now pass to session of comments or some questions? Sure. Start sure. With our dear Hoja Aziz Sanjar, Professor Aziz Sanjar. Aziz Hoja, please come. Uh, all right. Um, I am truly honored. Um, Dr. Alter, that you accepted this invitation. This is a great honor for me. Um, and you have a great sense of humor. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one myself. Um, I, I looked at the uh, Nobel proceedings and you didn't participate much in the Nobel Minds, I believe, in 2020. Um, where they uh, have the Nobel winners around the round table and um, ask questions and uh, about various things and um, get their opinion. Um, so when I participated, uh, a, a lady by uh, the, the name Zainab Badawi, um, I think she worked for BBC, uh, was running the show. <laughs> and um, on several occasions, I said, uh, I am I am really jealous of so-and-so. And I said it several times. <laughs> then she, she said, Dr. Sanjar, you, you're really a, um, a very jealous person. What's your problem? And I, I said, look, I, I got the Nobel Prize for doing very basic science um, on DNA repair. Um, I'm sure eventually it will help uh, treat diseases, cure cancer, but it's not there yet. But these people um, and the, the people that I was very jealous of were Campbell, who developed a drug that prevents river, river blindness. Mm -hmm. And um, Yu too from China, who I said Artemisin for treating malaria. I said, look at these people. <laughs> They're saving millions and millions of lives. How can you not be jealous of them? And so here I'm sitting listening to you. I'm really, really jealous of you. Thank you very much for what you've done for humanity, for all of us. 
um, for outstanding research. I'm I'm really grateful that you agreed to give this first lecture, which is a great honor for me. But at the same time, you being the first lecture at any extra dimension for it. I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Mm. Uh, thank you so much. That's a, a, a very warm statement. And uh, I watched you smile during my presentation. That kept me going. <laughs> but, but you should not be jealous because none of these drugs or treatments or anything happen in a vacuum. They're always built on prior, prior work. Uh, and, uh, and you never know, I had no idea that when this thing started out that, uh, it would lead to a new virus and ultimately to, uh, uh a cure for that, for that virus, even though I, I had nothing specific to do about the cure part. Uh, so you don't know where, where stuff is going. You just do what you can do and you follow one step after another. Uh, so you have nothing to be jealous about. You did great work, and uh, and who knows what will come out of it later on. So thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, Hassan Ojan, Professor Hassan Mandal, will you uh, make some comment, please? Uh, but still, I mean, some of our colleagues want to ask a question. So Zeynep Hanım, I think he's. Um, I mean, uh, want to ask a question, I think. Yes, maybe we can give the floor to her. Sure, sure, please. Say that one, please. Yeah, yeah, okay. I was waiting for the host to unmute me. There's an echo. Sorry. Sorry. There's an echo. I think there are two. Okay. Um, yeah, I think now it's okay, isn't it? Yes, it is okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me um, so let me express my feelings about uh, Dr. Uh, Holter and Professor uh, Sanjoy because uh, it's a great honor to meet with them, to uh, watch them, uh, and this was an amazing presentation. Also, it was really th there were so many detailed information um, about uh, hepatitis C, and also it was fun. Uh, and <laughs> I was knowing your um, wife's prayer and I have no idea about the best day of the week for you because you said that Tuesday is not the best day. So I wonder what is the best day? Uh, is there any specific that, that you picked as a great day for you? <laughs> well, in, in truth, I've enjoyed every day of working. Uh, oh, it's uh, Sunday though. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, science is so inherently interesting. Medicine is so interesting that uh, uh, for me, they were all good days. They weren't all productive days. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but they were, they were, they were enjoyable days. Uh, and my wife uh, it, it has been a great partner. She's always supported me. But again, for the young people, I always say the hardest part of research is getting the balance between your work and your family. Uh, it's an almost impossible endeavor, but you have to really try hard to not, not leave your family, your children in the lurch while you're doing your work. Um, so I, I think reason why I'm still single because I have no idea how to balance that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very difficult. And uh, and when you do get a partner, you need to have a partner who's really supportive. But it can be done. Yeah. So uh, let me introduce myself. First of all, I'm an assistant professor in Bursa Uluda University in law faculty. So I'm uh, interested in medical law and ethics uh, specifically. 
specific there. So my question is a little bit about the, uh, you know that the most popular virus is COVID-19 at the moment. So uh, I wonder, is there any correlation between COVID-19 and the patients with hepatitis C? This is the first question. And also um, about the vac vaccination, I mean, like, um, would you make some comments about the vaccination of hepatitis and whether, um, like, because there are so many individuals um, um, rejecting uh, the corona vaccination or COVID-19 vaccination. And what do you think about these um, vaccination for hepatitis? So you think that uh, individuals have rights still to uh, reject um, the vaccination or do we have to treat them if they reject the vaccination? So I wonder what you think about the ethical and the human rights aspect of um, the treatment and the vaccination part of the hepatitis and also the correlation between COVID-19 and hepatitis. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not aware of a COVID-induced hepatitis, uh, although the virus gets around to almost every organ, so I imagine it can get to the liver as well. Uh, but that that particular aspect is not a problem. Uh, the vaccination question is a great ethical question, a social ethical question. Uh, I can personally not understand why people would not take the vaccine. It's, it's very clear that it's, it's life-saving, hospital-saving. Uh, it doesn't prevent, the COVID vaccine doesn't prevent infection, but it definitely prevents serious disease in most cases. Uh, and why, why anyone would want to risk uh, hospitalization or dying from COVID just, just out of uh, whatever. Uh, and I know in America, it, it's a political issue, not so much a, a medical issue. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the world, but it, it's a shame. Uh, in terms of hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B vaccine is incredibly effective, effective. And if every country gave birth doses to newborns, uh, hepatitis B could be prevented uh, almost entirely. Uh, and Taiwan has done beautiful studies to show that with universal vaccination of newborns, not only do the rates of hepatitis go down and liver disease go down, but the rates of cancer go down uh, very dramatically. So the vaccination program is something that every country should do for B. We don't have a vaccine for C uh, and there's nothing immediately on the horizon. Therefore, this test and treat strategy is the way to cure without a vaccine. Uh, instead of preventing, you cure. And because it's such a innocuous treatment uh, that you can just give it to everybody. Uh, uh, so that's the stage we're at. I don't even know if, if people are gonna pursue a vaccine because the treatments are so good. Uh, although if you really want global elimination, a vaccine is the best way to go. Okay, more question, please, or comment. Okay, so I may take the floor. So I, thank you very much. I am Professor Hassan Mandal, is the president of Tubitak. So once more, we thank the Dr. Halter very much. I mean, we really enjoyed from from the lecture, in a sense of uh, from the an educating uh, type of uh, lecture and also going deep in science and also showing the impact. So I think it's the kind of a way also we are learning, uh, including myself, how we can, I mean, um, introduce our presentation in terms of the education part, in terms of the science part and in terms of the impact. And there are many young researchers are following this lecture and I can, read that, I mean, many, at least 40 uh, comments coming from the chat. Uh, they're all thanking you, Dr. Halter, 
and also including, of course, to our professor Aziz Hoja, Aziz Sanja. I mean, um, uh, putting all uh, I mean yeah, his efforts as well to I mean solve the problem uh, of the uh, of the humanity, but also showing that how the science is important and also how the we can educate the people by means of the science. So. In this respect, I thank you very much for your giving your time for us. Uh, I mean, for you for I mean sharing with us, and um, and I also thank Professor Aziz Sanjahoja. I mean, he is also I mean joining us for today, and um, of course we will keep in touch with you. And I am sure that I mean our young uh, scientists, although we'll, um, I mean in future we will have more difficult challenges, more complex and more dynamic challenges. But this type of lectures are giving a kind of a um, potential and also the more responsibility that um, yes, the science is, um, I mean, there's more difficult challenges, but the science will give the right answer. So thank you very much for your kind attendance and contribution for our lecture and also the science and also for the humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Arvid, there are a huge number of messages in the chat. All of them thanks you for this nice lecture, uh, expressing the gratitude and many, many good words in your address and also in your address, uh, also address of uh, Aziz Sanjar Hojam. Um, I'm very sorry that circumstances make it so I couldn't be there. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, this, this seemed to work out well. I'm very yeah. pleased, pleased to be here. Yeah, we, we hope and we look very forward to see you in person in future. Okay. With us here. Yeah. So okay. maybe a couple of last questions, please. Scientific questions, please. Okay. So, I mean, maybe Oginoja, I mean, he's the uh, former. Yeah, student yeah, sure. Of yeah. Okay, yeah. Jan, please come. Well, thank you oh, very okay. much. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Halter, thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, so nice to see how things were done uh, previously because with, this, with the today's technology, it would have been so different to discover a virus, right? So right. it was so nice to sort of uh, see how uh, you did the discovery. So I had, uh, out of curiosity, I had some questions. So you said that there is also non-ABC virus, right? And uh, first, my question is, have you figured out what that non-ABC was? And my second question is, how did it uh, get disappeared? Is it because of the an antiviral treatments? And why did they sort of get lost? Okay. Well, I, I know we looked for a non-A, non-B, non-C virus uh, and separate from hepatitis E, which is, is a real, another hepatitis virus. Uh, and, and really, in going back, I don't think there is another one. Uh, I think what we're looking for were uh, liver enzyme elevations, and I now think those were probably due to NASH, to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which we didn't know about at that time. Uh, so I don't think there's another virus we're going to call hepatitis virus D or F. Uh, but there are other known viruses that occasionally cause hepatitis. So cytomegalovirus, and now there's an adeno-associated virus that's causing hepatitis in children. Uh, so it's not primarily a hepatitis virus, but it's affecting uh, livers of children very seriously. Uh, there is a animal virus, a circovirus, which uh, has just been reported as causing hepatitis in a transplant recipient. Uh, so the answer is there There will be viruses causing hepatitis, but they won't be specific hepatitis viruses. Thank you. Aziz Ojan, would you like please to make final comments? 
And then I will ask Professor Harvey to make final comments, and then maybe we can, if you don't mind, close the session. Okay. So before closing the session, Aziz Hojan, would you like to make final comment? Yeah, I mean, Aziz Hojan, can you open your voice? Yes, I, I, I will. I, I would like to sincerely thank Dr. Alter again, um, because this is um, the first of the Sanja lecture, and it, it is um, very important for me, and I think for this lecture series that is by a scientist with great contribution both scientifically and to humanity for preventive health. So um, um, I, I can't say good enough uh, um, about the contribution of Dr. Alter. I am very grateful to him um, for, for you, for uh, the organizers of, of this uh, lecture series. I'm grateful to my country that really honors me and to Tibetak that has been very supportive and to you, Alikram Hoja that uh, took the initiative and organized this lecture series. Thank you all very much. And I thank all the participants uh, for um, hearing both Dr. Alter and my comments here. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz Hujam. That was a pleasure and honor for us, indeed. Harvey, uh, so yeah. once again, I want to sincerely thank you for all you have done today for us, for your kindness, for accepting our invitation, and for coming and joining us this evening. Will you please uh, like to make your final comment? Well, well, thank you again for, for the invitation, but I, uh, I just, it, it feels that incomplete because I can't go shake the hands of you and Dr. Sanjia. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, uh, I would like to do that. Uh, and, um, but anyway, it's been a, a great experience for me. I, I, I like to teach and I like to hear, have young people listening in, uh, and even old people too. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, I thank you for the invitation and I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, bye. Bye-bye.